50 years ago was a time when civil rights were legal. A time of war and body counts and assassinations. But the resistance was lethal. Maybe worth thinking about 1968 amid today's deep divisions. And remember how the country once looked. Brain drain is the departure of educated or professional people from one country, economic sector, or field for another, usually for better pay or living condition. Most college graduates from the Philippines wanted to go overseas for greener pastures, uh, like professionals, doctors, nurses, teachers, engineers. Because of the economic and living condition in the Philippines, brethren immigrated to the various parts of the world. Like me, because I uh, wanted to be a general surgeon, I wanted to train in the United States. After I graduated from high school, my uh, father and my mother asked me, if I would consider taking nursing if I really want to go to America. It is not the nursing that I wanted. It's the idea that they will send me to America. With my medical school classmate, I went to the United States. The reasons, number one, is to pursue my residency training in surgery. Later, I was given fellowship specializing in cancer surgery at Memorial Sloan Kettering and Cornell University College of Medicine. There was a time that professional brethren from the Philippines came to New York every week, every month, and that is why New York became the congregation of professional brethren. It was because of the great demand for nurses here in America that so many, many agencies from uh, different hospitals all over the United States were going to the Philippines to recruit nurses. So I was, I was recruited and I came to America. God had really a purpose for me in coming to America. I was one of those who helped in starting the regular uh, prayer meetings here. Of course, I didn't know that then. I was just focused on the things that I missed. And you know, having been in away from worship services and away from the Philippines for a while, I was writing to him that I was already ready to go back to the Philippines.
Dear Sister Norma, Your letter and the enclosed pictures reached me and I am indeed happy to see them. I just have a few instructions for you. Seek out as many brethren as you can in New York. Gather yourselves. Pray. I will be coming to New York City to meet you. I reiterate my wish that you may never forget your fundamental connection with the Lord and His Church. I have the letters all answered by Cardi. Every time I wrote to him, he always answered. What I, uh, I believe in is that God's purpose for me is here, which I realized over time. When we learned that Brother uh, Ranyo de Manalo was coming, we could not sleep anymore. We, we didn't want to sleep. You do anything to to be with our leader, yeah. I was excited, I was looking forward to it. We took the subway very early and we were at New York Hilton Hotel down in the lobby. That is where we waited to have our prayer meeting with Brother Ranyo Manalo. It's all inspiring, especially when we prayed for us and told us to stay together strong because you are the realization of the, the prophecy that, 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 that is spread, the church will spread in this, in this continent, in this part of the world. From Hawaii to San Francisco, to New York City. So we were deceived in New York City. It was a wonderful feeling. Can you imagine? It's Brother Erdy now. You know, you're going to be with in a prayer meeting. <laughs> it was so. And then he was the one who prayed. And how much happier could we have not been? And it was a very, very, very powerful powerful prayer that touched everybody's heart. There he gave instruction. Hanapin mo sila, tipunin mo sila, at manalangin kayo. At that time, there was no advanced technology. Landline and payphone calls was the only means. So the advice is search for the other brethren. I asked central office if they could give me names and addresses of brethren that I could get in touch with. And they did send me uh, some uh, names of members who were in Philadelphia, Virginia, uh, Washington, D.C. And so then I started writing to them. Brother Dante Capistrano, oh, who was also a doctor of medicine, he was in another hospital. I went to another hospital in Baltimore. And we used to have our own committee prayer. We have our own prayer. And then he told me that he learned that uh, there was a group meeting in New York. So we decided to go to New York.
I met him first in a party of my co-worker. Usually, Christmas and New Year, we have better foods in the hospital. I was not dancing that time, so she asked me why I don't dance. I happened to say, you know, I don't celebrate Christmas. And then they said, oh, what kind of religion do you have that you don't celebrate Christmas? Although he was an Iglesia Ni Cristo. So, and then I said, I'm Iglesia Ni Cristo. Then, that excited him. And then he said, okay, here we are. Even without others, you have to follow your faith to the doctrines in the church. Through the will and guidance of God, we were able to find each other. Eight of us, I believe, were the ones that were regularly starting in the Bronx. So then, sabi namin, paano kaya tayo, ano, where will we look for a place? This was owned by uh, Brother Howard Royal. He was not a member. And when I told him we need a house that we can do the worship service, he gave it to us. He made the second floor as the house of worship. I arrived here in uh, June 12, 1972. There is a group worship service in Brooklyn. And our worship service, we listen to the uh, tape-recorded uh, sermon that comes from the Philippines. I came with my wife. We have no relatives. We have no job. And then I started looking for the chapel. So we took the subway. Then we were looking for a chapel because you came from the Philippines, big, big chapels. And it was like a, a family house. During that time, the church is already looking for a place of uh, worship. If you can find a uh, house of worship for sale, we have to tell them. One thing that we would really see to the brethren of their great desire to have their own place of worship. Just imagine the, the halls that they're renting and even the houses of the brethren could not accommodate the worshipers. Their prayers were answered by our Almighty God. LIC, when we came, was already established and I was very impressed because when uh, my husband told me, you know, how the chapel looked like, you didn't see it, but it was burnt and look at it now. When this was first purchased, it was an abandoned, a dilapidated, rundown building. But we fixed this place because all the brethren are, help, are helping, they are pitching in. We have a devotional prayers. That's our preparation and continuous uh, working on this place so that uh, this will look like uh, really a house of worship. We were all here all, always putting tiles there. So we were pointing. <laughs> But it was fun. Ganda ng feeling ni nang. The brethren were just so happy and so grateful that they were able to come and witness the dedication of the chapel here. To tell you frankly how we were all so excited, all of us bought new dresses. <laughs> all new dresses. The women, we bought new dresses just for that dedication. 
It was a wonderful feeling, indescribable feeling. The local and the chapel will become a landmark in Long Island City. When I saw my daughter before that they attend, when they attend and do the community prayer and bringing them together like that in the community prayer, it's like molding them. They will not go astray. My memories of us always being together and all the activities and all the families. I remember what it was like as a child growing up, that it was just so nice. There's life on the corner. It's not like it's just a dark building. There's always some kind of life going on there. And that's a very good sign for the neighborhood. If you take care of God's house, God will take care of you. And the church was always a good part of the community. Well, the growth of the church is uh, really amazing. And the best way to learn is from the example of others, but also adapt them in uh, your own office or duty or responsibility. God's plan is always the best. Kasi nga, kahit sa isip natin na it's impossible, God will always make a way to make all things possible. Whenever I see photos of uh, past pictures from Long Island City, or brethren that I grew up with, or brethren that raised me when I was growing up. Um, I can't forget a lot of my core memories are from Long Island City. Um, and when I see those old photos, I, I always, always try to look if I'm in those photos. I see if my family are in those photos. And um, I can say that majority of the time was inside the chapel. All of uh, my life's events happened there, happy moments, blessed moments. My favorite was our annual New Year celebrations because we would have area competitions like choral group or various participation like fashion show or comedy. Even though we are from different families, we felt like one big family. Especially when you look back at, at the events we used to have in the function hall, it, they always brought everyone closer and people just got would bond so so much over it and we would have such great memories of these events and every time they would just get better and better you know I'm proud to say my dad he would carry his video cam with him to all the church events and afterwards he would just transfer it to VHS tapes and make copies for everyone in our hotel knowing that we've had those activities I don't even know how we fit to be for being on computers. We were always outside running around. We didn't have computers, we didn't have any cell phones, anything. We were, we were enjoying being kids. Back then, we had to pretty much stay within the confines of the chapel and because of that, we became really good friends with each other. Um, we were able to form friendships and become tighter and, and stronger as a group in, in being able to lead the other brethren. I remember like it was a great time. And after choir practice was done, we would still just be hanging out, or at least we were together, whether we were you know, at the chapel itself or doing something together. Being at the chapel always felt like home, like all the brothers and sisters really felt like brothers and sisters and, and as family. So it was almost like an escape from the real world. There's no other feeling like it. This is your true home is in the house of worship. So having a group of people in the church that we could also call family was really nice. Growing up with that, I want that to be the same for my, my kids too, my family now, that the church won't just be a place where we can worship together, but it's a place where you make friends and, and family, people that you'll remember for the rest of your life. COVID it put a halt to basically everything in the world. New York shut down everything uh, from businesses to religious gathering. Uh, it was basically a lockdown where everyone had to stay home and you can only go out for essential needs. Almost every day from the morning until evening, there would be 
uh, ambulance uh, running over the street, which means there are really many people uh, suffering from that pandemic. When the pandemic hit, you can see the brethren struggling. Some have lost their work, uh, some have lost their loved ones. It was early in the morning. I got up because I need to go to the bathroom. So after going to the bathroom, I remember going up the steps. Then all of a sudden, I hear, uh, I hear a big bang. That's when I realized that, uh, that I blacked out. And that's when my relatives heard the uh, loud sound and they came out of the rooms um, trying to assist me. I already had problem breathing. So they called the ambulance and you know, they tried to give me oxygen. And that same morning, I was rushed to the hospital. Usually, you know, when we're not together, we text. But I was really, really sad when I left him in the ICU and I brought two phones home with me. I don't really m remember much of it, but the only thing that I was worried about was my wife because she was pregnant. I was more worried about them. You know, what if they got affected because of me? We're very thankful to the church administration because we were already doing video streaming. Whenever Ka Eduardo was going to preach somewhere uh, in another location, we would still be able to connect via WebEx to have that broadcasted here in this part of the world. The church administration already prepared us and that during the pandemic, we were already ready to keep our worship services going. I really appreciate the sincere care of the administration because we need the message from the administration. We need those inspirational messages, those uh, instructions that keep us going. I don't think brethren would be able to like handle the fact that they wouldn't be able to worship because that's it's part of your lifestyle. It's who you are. It's what you do. While I was in the hospital, they allowed me to be able to connect through my phone. And it was a video streaming. And there was a verse um, that Brother Eduardo um, said during his preaching that, um, don't be afraid, stand up straight and look up to heaven and call out to him and pray to him. So that gave me more hope strengthen my faith that our mighty God will help us through this test and that everything will be okay. The church administration and their helpers are the true frontliners of our faith because they are the ones who teach us and inspire us with the words of our Almighty God. But the church continued in achieving these victories, building more houses of worship, many more joining the holy ministry, many more people taking these offices that really helped out. The church administration is still keeping us active, even if we're attending worship service in our homes. Every worship service, Brother Eduardo is instructing us through the words of God how we can not only overcome the things happening, but also to achieve our eternal life and salvation. Always see the beauty and the wonder of being a member in the Church of Christ. The significance of being led by the executive minister, by the church administration placed by our God, that would always think of us, that would not stop teaching us, reminding us, with the great love and mercy of our God, we were all able to survive. The visitation of our late executive minister, Brother Iranio Chimanalo, to New York was a great step of our Almighty God to make sure that the work of salvation here in this part of the world will continue. They felt 
the guidance of the church administration and up to now and they could feel the same love and concern of our beloved executive minister brother eduardo v manalo When I was first asked to help in the LSC 50 project, I didn't really know what to expect. When someone sees a video, what they don't realize is that it actually takes so much longer, um, you know, so much patience, so many days. I think we've been working on the project probably six, seven months, but it, it's something that uh, the team worked hard on. We don't really think about like the setup or the lights or how things are supposed to be angled. Sometimes it takes like two hours just to produce something that looks good. One of the biggest challenges was definitely trying to tell the story of how this locale came to be. A lot of researching, a lot of fact checking. You have to track a lot of brethren down 50 years ago. It is a lot of work. Uh, first and foremost, prayer is a powerful tool in everything that we do. Finding that balance between um, work, school, church, family. After I go to work, I tend to come here straight. If I'm not at home, I'm, I'm here. I will remember all the work that we did. Every Saturday, we would come to the chapel and start transcribing, cutting interviews, or doing interviews, and then have a break, eating. It was really fun. You know, I may spend hours in the chapel. Like, like that's fine. Like, I don't feel bad about it. I feel good because I know that my time has gone into something productive and uh, worth it. We laughed together, we struggled together, you know, but in the end, we managed to do it all because it was all for God. The Bible uh, teaches us, find your happiness in the Lord. That means find your happiness in doing works for the Lord. These are the things that they will remember when they grow up. The times that they spent in the chapel, not just hanging out, but working for something so great such as this celebration. I hope that the youth from this documentary learn about all the hardships that the brethren have gone through, everything that they have built up to get to where we are. I've lived here my entire life. I did not know that the history ran so deep. Being able to live and see all the hard work of the brethren is, is really something special. Hearing like the stories of how hard they worked and getting the chapel to where it is now. That's what inspires me because they put so much time and effort into it and look, this place is still blessed by God and it's still going strong 50 years. Some of them don't know what the pioneering members experienced 50 years ago. I didn't even know until I talked to the brethren, you know. Uh, I didn't know that before there were brethren who would drive, travel from there to Long Island City just to attend the worship service, just to um, perform their duty. What the brethren did during that time must remain fresh in their hearts and minds so that it would always inspire them. One thing that the church administration through the leadership of Brother Eduardo Manalo always wants to remind us is that there's a clear distinction between us and the people of the world. And that's exactly what we're seeing today with this project. Imagine the youth of this church are gaining new skills, video editing, singing, videography, but they're using it for good. They're using it to promote the words of God and most of all, the miracles that God has performed and will continue to perform in the Church of Christ. Those stories of the pioneering members, kailangan hindi maputo yun. That legacy of being dedicated as a member of the Church of Christ is important because, as mentioned also by our Executive Minister, Brother Eduardo B. Manalo, that the young members, they are the future of the Church. So, to pass on that dedication of our pioneering members, pagka naipasa yun, 
ang iglesia tatatag. Ang iglesia patuloy na lalaganap. At higit sa lahat, yung mga kapataan. Hindi sila matutukso na mahawa ng mga bagay sa sanlibutan. Okay. <laughs> so one. Okay. Three, two, one. Yeah, look at that. Perfect. Everybody in the world knows New York City. 